Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and after the first week of a July filled with four F1 support heavy Grand Prix, I'm already exhausted. F1, F2, F3 and W Series were all in action at Silverstone and every championship had at least one race filled with drama. To help me unpack it all, I'm joined by three guests, all tailor-made to tackle this weekend's action. On a weekend when Williams back drivers reached the Silverstone podium in F2, F3 and W Series, I can't think of a more perfect fit than having a Williams back driver who has reached the Silverstone podium in F2, GP3, but curiously not W Series. Welcome to the podcast, Jack Aitken. Care to explain when you're planning on taking a British W Series win? Sex change incoming. Yeah, that's <laughs> going to be the second win in my career. Um, yeah, no, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. It's really good to have you, Jack. Next up, on a weekend filled with single seaters racing around a classic British track where there felt like an endless stream of races, I can't think of a more perfect fit than having a classic British racer turned broadcaster who voiced an endless stream of consciousness all weekend not only across F2 and F3, but IndyCar as well. Welcome, Tom Gaymore. I'm impressed you still have a voice left for us. I bet you slept well on Sunday night. Yeah, it was a long weekend, especially with the way Formula 3 was kicking off or bookending the start of a few of the days meant that if you were going long into the evening, as IndyCar is, it was was a difficult one, but uh, I'm here to tell the tale. And um, yeah, I can't complain. It's a wonderful job. Yeah, it was terrific calling as well, alongside Chris and Harry, previous guests on the podcast. And finally, on a weekend where 15 feeder series drivers joined the press conferences to chat all about their triumphant races, I can't think of a more perfect fit than having a triumphant return to the podcast for an F1 feeder series editor who spoke to those drivers in the press conferences. Welcome back, Michael McClure. Have you recovered from a spectacular weekend at Silverstone? You know, it still feels like I'm going. I mean, I'm in the middle of writing, I think, my 15th article of the, of the race weekend. So I think the recovery will probably come tomorrow and Wednesday, if I'm being honest. But no, it was really great to do it. Um, first time for me doing the press conferences for both F2 and F3. Um, and just a real pleasure to get that, that direct insight from the drivers. And, you know, when you're at home, you obviously don't get as much access as you do when you're in the paddock. But even just having that opportunity to hear from them, hear how things went for them, what they could do better. is just It's just really great for, you know, moving from that stage of being a fan into being a, a media person. Yeah, the journalists, uh, the journalists, we really do get a, a another insight, which is the whole point of journalism, bringing the fans to the races when they can't be there. Before we get into it, just a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe if you are watching on YouTube. And if you don't have time to listen or watch each week, you can still find some great short videos on our channel with our best bits. And if you are listening to the audio only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. You can leave a rating on Spotify, preferably five stars. And you can also review us on Apple Podcasts if you have a spare two minutes. Thank you to everyone who rates us. It really does help us out. Let's start from the main feeder series event, Jack. The Great British Summer was out in force because we had rain and sun. That is a true British summer. And yet we still had two first-time winners in Formula 2, including a commanding lights to flag win for your Williams associate, Logan Sargent. Is that the rookies getting used to Formula 2, do you think? Or is it them racing around a very familiar Silverstone track? A bit of both, I'd say. Um, And it's probably not a coincidence that Carlin had quite a strong weekend, not just in F2, but in F3, it being their home track, of course, and plenty of testing miles done on there for uh, that outfit so yeah I was um, no, I was pleased to see it I mean Logan's really really strong really quick guy I uh, got to know him at the postseason test in Abu Dhabi last year where he also did a really good job by all accounts so uh, I think it was more a matter of time as to when he was going to get his first win and it was pretty commanding when he did it so fair play yeah the qualifying performance from uh, Logan Sargent was exceptional really he just kept churning in 
fastest laps and fastest laps. You've got the point there, which I haven't considered about Carlin just doing well at the home race. That data, is that the sort of thing that's just going to be using, we're using the same car, what, since 2018 now, Formula 2? Are they just going to know that track inside out and know exactly how to set the car up perfectly for their drivers? It certainly helps. Um, I think, yeah, the, the cars have changed a little bit year on year, mainly tyres that evolve as the seasons go by, but you can still learn something from it and get a rough idea of uh, what sort of philosophy you need to bring to the car. So they will have gone into the weekend with a bit more confidence than other places, I'm sure. And as well, he's got a very strong teammate to um, you know uh, bounce off on in uh, practice and try the setup changes, which are so, you know, you have such little time in Formula 2 um, to get the car dialed in on the weekend. And uh, Liam Mawson, extremely strong as well, obviously. Um, so having two strong drivers to to get the car dialed in, ready for quality, would have helped as well. And they did very well. Double podium for Carlin on Sunday. Tom, I'm suspecting that you're itching to talk about Sunday's lap one incident in the feature race but hold fire for a moment I, we are going to talk about it because how can we not but you commented every lap with friend of the podcast chris mccarthy during a pretty standard feature race but a wild sprint race who impressed you the most during that very wet saturday yeah i mean it was a really interesting weekend for, for everyone involved in formula two the step change from from last year really the tires so last year they had the medium and the hards and this year they had the hard and the soft so there was actually not too much data or comparable data from any of the years previously regarding the soft tire so for a lot of them they didn't obviously run that tire at all in free practice and then ran it for the first time in qualifying so that sort of underpins what a good job Logan Sargent did and what a good job Carlin did. And they were one of the few teams that was able to, to get three push laps, although they didn't complete the third out of the soft tyre. So it was really a strong position for them going into the race. So it's no surprise that he managed to convert and under big pressure as well, because you get nervous. So, you know, from my perspective, I think Logan with, with all the pressure on his shoulders starting on pole position and then having to convert. I think, you know, for me, he has to have uh, the most valuable player, MVP from the uh, from the weekend. That's a very American term there. I'm going to have to correct you, though, because I was talking about the sprint race where we had Mr. Doohan, son of the legend Jack um, Mick, sorry, I'm getting the wrong way around here, father and son, uh, had Jack do and do so well, getting his first silverware, first not silverware, first trophy, first winner's trophy. He was brilliant in a race where Darivala slipped backwards. You had Porsche advancing and then running out of tyres. And then we had three rookies take the podium. That was a terrific showing from those rookies, don't you think? Yeah, it was a really difficult race for everyone because you kind of had to race what you brung. It was too too wet for slicks and then they got into a very quick situation where the wets were overheating and then they were just passengers if you like they just had to keep it clean and try and do the best that they could and I think Doohan executed his move really well because once he made the position uh, or took the position the lead position he pushed really hard for, for a lap or two and then was able just to manage that gap. And we saw that you had to keep your powder dry. So poor chair, although, you know, he, he was coming from further back, he, once he'd used up all his tyres and worked hard to get a uh, uh, track position, he had nothing left in his armoury to, to challenge any any of the other cars. So, yeah, I think Doohan did a really, really good job. I mean, it was such a, a difficult race and I don't know if Jack saw it later on just watching the onboards was really painful I mean they couldn't turn into to any of the the quicker speed corners the car was just falling away and the, they just looked very very slow trying to uh, circumnavigate what was essentially gripping them onto the track which was a very very hot and bothered wet weather tyre <laughs> yeah those wet weather tyres are much peakier than, than what you find in most other series. You know, I think most most of the time you can abuse the wet 
in conditions like that because there wasn't really that much a dry track out there where, you know it was still damp and greasy um but like you said just by the end you could see everybody who was like bubblegum was so overheated especially the guys who had pushed on them earlier on and it was quite surprising well in a way it was surprising to see some of those rookies doing so well but then Iwasa for example who was coming on so strong at the end that dams car has always been known to be pretty kind on its tyres and I think um, the last time that I raced there, 2020, I remember very distinctly watching Sunoda in a, what was it in a damn score or is it a Carlin? My memory is failing me. But those, those, those Honda Junior drivers, they know what they're doing, I think, um, with the tyres. And um, it, it's funny that Formula 2, it's not always the uh, uh, logical thing, but you can have these guys come in and do a very good job by just, you know, having a slightly calmer, natural driving style than sort of the people who are a bit more aggressive. Awasa was really impressive, actually. I mean, he he definitely did keep his powder dry. And then when he knew that he could drop the hammer, he, he really closed the gap and, you know, another lap or two. And who knows? Just needed to start one lap earlier. <laughs> That's the other one. Yeah. I did think as well, and maybe Michael, you can uh, share your thoughts on this. It was Carlin, by the way. So uh, Carlin, where Sinoda was, Jack. So show it again at Carlin at Silverstone. <laughs> what a combination! That mm. we saw uh, the tires, like you say, turn into bubble gum, and because it's a sprint race, and because the track was in that weird evolution state, a pit stop was probably a bit too much of a let's let's be honest, a ballsy move. It might not have worked out all the best, but. Michael, if you were on the pit wall, would you have been considering bringing a driver in, depending on where they were positioned on the track? You know, it would probably be one of these cases where if you're like at the bottom of the top 10, someone who's really dropping out, like Jehan Daruvalo would be maybe mm. somebody I would bring in. Um, Dennis Hauger, they were really struggling, but I also know that they had they had set up issues at, at Prima. So I think if you're in the front group, you don't bring them in just because you're you're going to really lose the track position there. But But further back, I mean, it's worth a gamble, especially if you've got a teammate who's who's in the top five or is, is struggling just to you know get get another set of data and that you can you can use to help improve that lead driver we were looking and it it i think they were about 20 seconds off the yeah. the dry time so i think for the for the slip the delta was just was just too great and also you know there i don't know there just wasn't enough there wasn't enough elements of the track that were dry enough to get mm. some heat into that tyre and keep some heat into that tyre. Another 20-odd lap or another 10 laps or so could have been a, a bit more of an interesting uh, decision to make. Michael, as well, just you watched all the laps and we didn't see uh, in the press conferences Felipe Drogovic make an appearance because he never made the podium, but he's still just churning away those points, getting that consistency in. We're at the halfway point of the season now. Do you think anyone can challenge him? I think they can challenge him. I mean, I think there are drivers who on their day are faster. We saw this with, with Logan on Sunday, just, just brilliant drive. Um, we've seen even Porsche had some, some great runs early in the season. But I think the thing is, is that Drugovic just hasn't made mistakes this year, really. Um, he had that one, that one accident in Baku where he, where he hit the wall. And then, of course, the safety car came out right after Yuri Vips hit the wall. So it, it did save him. He got really lucky with that. And I think that's what we're seeing is that these other drivers that are especially the ones we thought might be contending for the championship, you know, Lawson, Vips, even Porsche to a degree, they've all had their bad races where they've made mistakes. And Drogovic just partly through luck, partly through just keeping his own powder dry and really driving very calmly has, has I think risen sort of above that. And you don't see him having really bad races, even when he's disappointed, he's usually still in the top five, top six. So I think, I think it's going to be very difficult for anybody really to, to get over him in the championship. He's just kind of got such a gap right now that I, I, I don't think that realistically we're going to see anybody else, at least not in the next few rounds, really pull it in. Maybe at the end there's a late surge, someone pulls a piastri, but it's, I think it's pretty unlikely at this point. Yeah, it does look like the, uh, the champion elect already. It's been, it's been a terrific season for him. I said we're going to talk about this and we're going to have to talk about it because there was... Another terrible crash on Sunday before Joe's freak accident. Roy Nisani's life was saved by the halo when Dennis Hauger's Prima went airborne after hitting a sausage curb. Thankfully, Nisani, Hauger, and of course, Zhou Guan Yu and Alex Albon, who was hospitalized, all okay. 
that's the main thing and it highlights the safety of these cars right now there are some things to unpack here and jack i'm very conscious of your affiliation with uh, your team and so on with williams i'm not going to ask you to go too uh, too in depth on one element but there's two bits misani's driving standards are one thing after getting a grid penalty for the second weekend in a row because he took three places into Silverstone after Baku's crash, and he's going to take five going into the next race, which is Austria, of course, uh, after this crash. So that's one thing. Was he too reckless coming back on the track? And then second, and Tom, I'm going to give you a soapbox here because I heard you in the commentary, so I feel you've got a few points to, to make. In an era where cars are getting safer, we had a car go airborne because the track wasn't safe instead. So I'm going to open this to all of you, but Tom, do you want to take the, the first points? Yeah, I think just from my perspective, read really the track, I think when we see cars out of control and you've always got to expect the unexpected on a race circuit, having something like a curb that can actually double up as a ramp is a contentious issue. We should be minimising risk as much as possible. And for me, that those curves increase risk and where they're situated we've seen numerous times cars airborne and if it's not an incident that we saw at Silverstone where they collect another car it's the driver's well-being and safety as well because you know I talk from somebody who's broken their back I've got a metal lumbar spine when you are coming down from such a, a height it's very very damaging for the driver and we've had numerous examples of drivers who have had serious injuries off the back of various different incidents. And I just think it's about time that we maybe looked at those sausage curves again and, and said, well, we make such advances in all areas and we continue to push the envelope, re-safety, and there's no expense spared, re-safety. Why do we have these curves that, that actually can injure people and or worse and that's that's an important talking point for me and I, I look at it from a driver's perspective and I look at it from an FIA perspective you know it, 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 it there must be a better solution than those sausage curbs. Jack you are also looking at this from a driver's perspective how do you view the the sausage curb issue especially now that you're not racing in the single seaters and coming out from the GT world where my understanding is that they're more of a deterrent to stop the easy cut corner cutting possibilities yeah that's um, that's basically the the nail on the head of the problem which the FIA have that they're, they're fighting against two different problems because I absolutely agree with Tom um, I don't think the curbs are satisfactory it's not the first time that we've seen it it goes all the way back uh, I think like six years ago we saw was it that GP3 driver at Spa who let yeah. a proper takeoff at the bus stop Massive Very accident. Tango, yeah. Um, I've had um, Sean Galea launched off a curb next to me while we we're fighting at Barcelona, and yeah, he hurt his back. As Tom was mentioning, that's a very real concern. Um, so it's a problem that's been around for a while, and I imagine that the reason that it hasn't been addressed and that they're still there is track limits. Um, and it's something it's a topic that everyone talks about all the time, <laughs> but it's a really difficult one for the FIA to solve without creating other problems like this. Because, you know, they've tried bollards. Bollards are something that get used at some circuits. And I can tell you, having raced in GC3 for a little bit now, that's not really a great solution because you spend half the race on the a full course yellow with marshals running after bollards that are 100 metres away from where they were originally placed. Um, they clearly don't like to just have grass in those places anymore. Um, it, it, yeah, so they would have to find a suitable replacement to, to manage track limits in those areas. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think the sausage curbs really should be there. Any kind of serious um, bump or ramp is something that I find completely out of place on a racing circuit where you're doing hundreds of kilometers an hour. You know, um, again, coming back to back issues. Um, a friend of mine, Adrian Delina, who's a, a driver in GT3. Um, pretty badly broke his back in Mizano at a race last year because they had massive sleeping policemen 
on the exit of a very fast call on the exit of turn five, I think it is. Um, his car hit one, the nose lifted off, it landed back on the second policeman, which was five meters later, and it just created a rebound, rebound effect. So, and the FAA are aware of these things, they're working on it. I'm not saying it's easy by any stretch of the imagination, um, but yeah, something has to change. Michael, I'm going to let you take this bit as well. So, well, what's the solution, Michael? The FIA are working tirelessly. You must be as well. What, what should we do here? And then on the second point, which we have to talk about, and um, hearing another name mentioned there by Jack, just in terms of drivers driving recklessly and with a reputation of driving recklessly, how problematic is this? Because that was a huge safety concern on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, the the thing about sausage curves, I think, I mean, Tom and Jack, I think, basically said everything I was going to say. It's it's a thing we see in the, the younger categories as well. And in Formula 4, we had a couple of incidents this year. It was um, Alexander Partashev in Italian F4 at Misano was the one that, that comes to mind this year. Again, went off the curb, didn't break anything, but I mean, still had to sit out the weekend. And, and for for young drivers, especially, I mean, some of them are, are still growing physically. And that kind of thing is, is hugely damaging at that age, um, not only for your career, physically, financially as well. You, you spend this money, you get the seat, and then your, I mean, it's obviously your own health is is worth much more than that. But you're, you're just, it, it's really just damaging all aspects of of the driver driver's future. In terms of, I mean, the the driving standards. Obviously, what we saw with with Roy wasn't great. Um, but I think one thing that I did see a lot of people were calling for a for a race ban right away for that. And I think the stewards are in a very difficult position because it was kind of two separate things that sort of coalesced into one very ugly incident. Um, and they could really only penalize, I think, the first thing, which is where uh, Nissani touched Halgren and forced him off the track. The second thing that happened was was obviously terrifying, but I think that was sort of in some ways somewhat separated from, from the actually penalizable aspect of that, of that collision. And in terms of, I mean, looking at things, I think... It has happened. It is a pattern, but I don't think it is it is that unusual. And if I'm, I mean, certainly there there should be more investigation into this. But we have seen, if I'm being really honest, we have seen worse in in Formula Two and GP two. I think back to what Sergio Canamassas did in in 2014, for example, just going right across that chicane at Monza. I mean, that was that was again very obviously extremely dangerous. And in terms of unsafe rejoins, I think that's another thing that we can look into. I think it's all just, it highlighted several different problems, this incident. And I think it's going to take a while to, to really unpack it and figure out how to, how to make it better. We're going to have to move on though, because F2 wasn't the only racing in action. F3 gave us some terrific racing as well. The Academy drivers demonstrated their ability with Williams' Zach Sullivan taking pole, Red Bull's Isaac Hajar winning the sprint race, Ferrari's Arthur Leclerc winning the feature race, and Alpine's Victor Martin still the championship leader too. Jack, is that showing the F1 teams are backing the best drivers, or are these drivers becoming the best because of the F1's team backing? It's like a chicken and egg sort of question, this. Yeah, very philosophical question, that. Um... I'm not going to be boring and say, oh, it's a bit of both. It depends. But I think it's mainly the former. Um, for sure, being on a program like that, it's, it's helpful uh, and it gives you access to a lot of resource and uh, knowledge. But, you know, someone like Victor, for example, in the overall picture of uh, single-seater racing, he's actually quite experienced now. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the games there in, for him being at Alpine are pretty marginal. And really, he's there because that's a pathway for him um, rather than, you know, improvement of him as a driver. That's the reality. Um, When you're younger and less experienced, it's a bit different. There's more to learn. Um, And those uh, teams can be extremely helpful for you. But, um, yeah, these guys getting into F3 and F2, I think it's much more that the teams are trying to pick the guys that that they want to see in those race seats going forwards in F1. Um, And, uh, yeah they seem to be back in the right ones for now. Although, as I said, Victor should be at the front, I think, you know, given his experience. And he is as well. But just from the inside of it, because we won't see this, your exposure, say with Zach as a 17-year-old, so a young kid relatively still making his way through, do you 
have a lot of interaction. I know Williams were doing some some training camp last week. I don't know if you were involved in that. Knocked out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But is that something that they look to somebody like a reserve driver to say, not from a coaching role, but just to, to gain insight, to listen in and, and debriefs and so on? So, I mean, my relationship with, with the academy is a little bit, um, I mean, I'm not technically part of the academy, um, being a reserve driver. Oh. Um, that being said, I still have, you know, some uh, interaction, I guess you could say. Uh, I know, you know, I've spoken with Logan a fair bit when uh, he was doing the testing in Abu Dhabi, for example, and I was there as well. Um, Jamie, I know and get on with very well as well. And um, we do some training together. Uh, Zach, I actually haven't met yet. Um, so we don't spend a lot of time day to day together, you know, uh, it's, um, it's difficult. And I think in terms of what you mentioned about the coaching, it's not unheard of. And certainly there are some things that I, I, I'm sure I could pass on or help with, but equally, I'm not so long out of that arena uh, myself. And sometimes it's difficult to have such a different perspective from, from someone who's only a few years behind you, if you see what I mean. Um, actually, you know, having a bigger world view of things a few more years down the road can be helpful. But yeah, um, certainly at Alpine, um, you know, they have Alice Powell doing that kind of role. She's actively racing and is, um, you know, part of uh, the W Series, but she's also mentoring and coaching at the same time, the the academy. And there's definitely um, some some mileage in that, I think. Absolutely. Uh, great to hear some of the behind the scenes stuff as well. I, I live for that sort of thing. The, the things that we don't see on the television every every race weekend. Tom, I'm going to come to you because you were in the comms box with the amazing Harry Benjamin, who somehow managed to call every bit of action with these two terrific races with who knows who's going to win in both feature and sprint race. It was changeable throughout really good to watch did f3 steal the show for you this week i know formula one was also amazing but this is f1 feed a series podcast so was f3 the, the the standout yeah i mean i think f3 is always exciting isn't it just by the very nature of the championship lots of cars one make championship and young drivers who are learning their trade so not necessarily prone to mistakes but can make the odd mistake and also are, are pushing uh with with one thing in mind and, and and that is to win the race i thought it was telling that that zach he you know it's the first time he's properly been at the track that he knows having come from the gb3 championship mm. and so being at a track that he knows british team that go well there that was good to see him actually convert in qualifying under a bit of pressure so Good job by him. Didn't have the outright pace in the race, but Arthur Leclerc was was very, very good. I think Isaac Hajar was the most impressive for me in terms of peak performance. So you look at, okay, didn't quite get there in, in, in the feature, but but did in the sprint. But Kyle Collette, for example, had, there was a real element. He missed out in qualifying, should have been on pole, definitely, if you look at it and then made made a difficult start, just didn't quite hit his marks. Whereas Isaac Hajar and, and Arthur Leclerc very much did do that. And I think Isaac Hajar just shading it for me. He was very aggressive, very quick, and he's going to be one to watch, definitely. I, yeah, you know, for Zach, he, he, he looked quite mature in terms of how he went about his race. So didn't panic when he lost the lead didn't make any mistakes and and consolidated really maybe not quite as aggressive as Isaac Hajar but you can easily throw a result away in in a in a short race or or one of those feeder series races so he didn't do that he showed a lot of maturity so yeah some good drives throughout the field in my eyes it really was. And you said about Hajar's aggressiveness which took him to the front in on Saturday sprint race and then coming together with Crawford in the in the feature race as well with some very close racing. I think we're going to actually have Hajar on the podcast fairly soon as well. This guy is really accelerating through the feeder series ranks. He's been picked up by Red Bull and won in Monaco and Freca last year. With the Crawford incident, it's one of those weird... They were so close and he was trying to back out of it, right? Because he's going into the first corner, just edged his way out, but just they did touch. 
it's weird because they've got the team affiliation within the teams and then the academy affiliation. Do you think that's the sort of thing they'll have a conversation about afterwards or is this just it's racing I wouldn't care if you are my teammates or anything? You know what? I, I thought it was a racing incident. Obviously, they got their knees and elbows out at the club chicane before that and Crawford gave Hadjar and Hadjar did try and back out of it. I mean, he took Crawford pretty deep. Yes, the rules say if you're behind and you touch another car, then then essentially you are the culprit. But you know, I, I think that that's that's really harsh. I, I thought that was good hard racing. They just ever so slightly crossed the line, and I thought it was really unlucky for Crawford. Don't get me wrong; if you're Crawford, you are spitting feathers <laughs> and you are incandescent in terms of what's happened to you, and it's totally and wholly unjust. But you know, Hajar didn't do anything too untoward there and he did try and get out of it so good hard racing sometimes people lose out and and Crawford did lose out but you know Hadjar I think Behrman did a good job by the way somebody I didn't mention earlier and he had his fair share of uh you know fair share of close calls as well with and the, made incident. the feature race be brilliant at the end that was the closest yeah, we're yeah, going to was... see any cars cross the line at Silverstone that was terrific yeah, I thought he did a good job. He really, really did. Uh, just going to quickly was through one final question because I was just conscious of how much we could talk about all these races. Michael, it's crazy to say this, but after, well, we're about halfway through the season as well in Formula 3, and Prema have won their first race in the series, even though they're leading the championship anyway. Behrman, as we were just talking about, nearly made it a one-two finish. Crawford was up there to before fellow Red Bull junior Hajar tapped his wheel, sent him off the track. Leclerc won out. What do you think changed, if anything, at Prima for Silverstone? Or is this just a case of it all finally just came together and they've been great all season? Yeah, I'd probably say it's it's more towards the latter. I mean, the, the first weekend they struggled in qualifying. I remember this. They were quite far down. I think only Behrman made it on the, the top 10 reverse grid. And, and what I remember there was that they... Um, the it was this car setup that was just optimized for the race. And I think that's sort of generally been their approach. Um, and you can see it, you can see it now, but what it just happened that everything came together, especially for, for Arthur Leclerc, I would say, because he, he had two bad qualifyings to start the year, had that, he had the accident in Imola qualifying. And then again, in the feature race in Barcelona, he had, I think he crashed with David Vidalas. And so he obviously lost out of it there. And this weekend he just, he was up front. He was starting in second. He got by, by Zach fairly quickly and, really just after that was able to control the race. And I think it was for, for Arthur in particular that this weekend is when he finally put it all together. Um, last year, he was there sometimes, but often he was just coming from too far back. And I think now we're seeing this other side of him, the, sa the same side of him we saw actually in the Formula Regional Asia Championship, where he was uh -huh. again, he was champion, did really well and, and had a lot of opportunities to be up front. And I think it's just about pulling pulling it all together. Obviously having his teammates up there can help as well. Um, both, I would say, Behrman and Crawford had had good runs this weekend. Not the cleanest necessarily, but I mean, strong pace for sure. Um, and I think I think that's the thing also is that Prema has just had all three cars there and no other team has really done that this year. Trident has had Stenak up front. He had not a great weekend this time. Edgar's obviously just come back from, from his Crohn's disease absence. And um, Maloney has just he's had the pace, but just not the results and mm -hmm. ART as well. We've got Martens is doing really well. He's, he's driving like a championship contender for sure. I mean, getting the results when he can, but he's had a couple of retirements um, earlier in the season and Correa and Sasu just weren't really there this weekend. So I think that's, that's the thing is Prima is just, they've got more sort of opportunities to get those results because they've got, they've got all three cars in the mix really at all times. We've got W Series as well. And just I want to get into the Ask F1 FS because there's a bunch of questions and I know we're not going to get through all of them. So let's let's whiz through this just because we have to have to do a shout out to JB Chadwick again in a series by herself almost, like W plus one or something, because she's just taken six wins in a row, fourth win of 2022. I presume, as you've said before, Jack, that you you know her well. Is she just the complete racer? Because she seems quick. She seems as professional as can be in press conferences when she's speaking to the media. Is is Jamie Chadwick the complete package? I mean, yeah, she's. I think she's showing 
for hopefully the third time that <laughs> she, she is in the arena of W Series. Um, I know that she she very much wants to to take that success and move it on uh, to to another another championship. Um, w series has been great i think to highlight her ability and off the back of that she's been able to you know have tests um she's got a great relationship with williams that hopefully you know will lead to greater things um i i think she's doing an excellent job and she's an excellent ambassador um for w series as well for everything that they're trying to do i think they've gotten quite lucky with her uh, as you say she speaks very well and She's just a, a, a great person all around. So I'm really hoping that we'll get to see her move into something next year where she will be, dare I say, challenged a bit more, um, not disrespecting, obviously, the, the other races in W Series, but she's winning pretty convincingly uh, so far this year, which, you know, she's already won the championships twice. Perhaps not that surprising, seeing as the turnover of drivers is not as high as Formula 2 or Formula 3, so she's still racing the same people um, to an extent. So, yep, um, she's doing a great job, and hopefully that leads to, to something new next year. Yeah, there's not really much more that she can do to to justify racing in another championship uh, with, with what she's got available at the moment. And you talk about convincingly winning a race. That was helped somewhat by, well, Kim Malinen and Abby Pulling crashing on the, the penultimate lap. Um, both managed to stay in position. That was good to see. But also Alice Powell couldn't make it three British wins from three. She was slapped with a 10-second stop-go penalty for being out of position at the first safety car line after problems in the formation lap. It seems harsh to get the harshest penalty in the rule book for something like that because it wasn't dangerous driving. And we saw something similar with Latifi at Baku when... One of his mechanics pushed his pushed him back, just touched a tyre just before the start of the race. Is it unfair, Tom, or is this just rules are rules and they have to be enforced? Do you know what? I haven't seen the incident, so I cannot comment decisively, but it, it's utterly frustrating for the driver and maybe for the fans as well who are looking forward to a certain dynamic and race ahead for the most innocuous mm. of, of situations to then rob the driver and the fans of that, that spectacle. So I understand rules are rules and so forth, but uh, there has to be a line sometimes. But either way, it, it seems that they, they cross the line. But yeah, it's, it's frustrating. It, it's really frustrating. And, and you know, sometimes you, you just think, well, a slap on the wrist or or a bit of common sense, or maybe give the team a fine, or just just another outcome might have might have been uh, been a richer scenario for everyone involved. Yeah, it's taken one of the front runners out of the race very early for something, as you say, innocuous is a perfect word. Um, a press release came out today, just with W Series, or back on Monday because this is Wednesday, of course, guys. Uh, detailing that over a million people watched W Series in the UK. That's far more than usual, and that's mainly thanks to it being on free-to-air TV because of it being a home race in the UK. Michael, for a series that wants to inspire the next generation of female talent, do you think being on cable and satellite services is actually hindering the championship's intent? You know, I don't think it really is. I mean, it's I believe it's broadcast that I'm in the United States, so I think it's broadcast here on, on ESPN, if I remember correctly, but... One thing that I think has surprised me since, especially since they've joined the, the F1 support bill is that it's not integrated within the F1 TV package. Mm. I don't know if there's a commercial reason for that. Um, I mean, this year they've got highlights on there, so you can see kind of part of the race, but you don't get the whole weekend really there. And and you do it, you do get that for F2, for F3, you get everything down to like press conferences and and highlights and practice sessions. And, and for W Series, it's just not there to that same degree. So I think in order to kind of build build a fan base and really make it feel like it is part of that, that support. But I think you are going to need to, to sort of bring it over onto, onto F1 TV, just to give it that, that integration. And I know it's not a traditional feeder series in the sense, obviously it's, it's just women competing in it, but that does, it's still a part of the, the part of the show, no matter what. And it's, it's great racing. I mean, I, I watched the highlights for this and I mean, there was, 
obviously Chadwick ran away with it, but there were some great moves too. It's it's certainly something that is is I think worth watching, and and it's a shame that we don't. I think we just don't get more of it for those of us that don't have cable or or aren't in a place where it is it is readily accessible. So I think I think there have been the right steps made for this year, but I think there there is still opportunities to to grow it even further. I think I'm probably showing my age a little bit talking about free to air TV rather than a streaming platform like Netflix or F1 TV being a bit more appropriate for it. Speaking of which, Tom, I heard you showed your age by talking about the new Silverstone layout, which I feel that, but it's been what 10 years since they changed. I did, I did add the disclaimer. I did add the disclaimer. <laughs> I say the new Silverstone layout every single time, but it's it's once you get to my tender age. You, you do think that everything is just a couple of years ago and then you realise it's about two decades ago. <laughs> Hashtag bring back the I need to know that I've never raced on the old Silverstone layout. Oh. I'm, I'm an old driver <laughs> these days. So. Yeah, exactly. That That's frightening. Yeah, I think the, one of the very first F1 races I watched was was on the old layout, but I just don't remember it super well. So Rich. Bridge was was ahead yeah, of a corner. It, it, it really great, was. Great However, I do have to say the current layout from this is going way off topic now, but the current layout <laughs> going essentially from the loop all the way over to Cops is tri- like some of the battles we've seen through the years in Formula One, two, three on this new layout, terrific. And I was just like, why are they changing it? Other oh, motorbikes have ruined it. But I think Silverstone's just one of the top tracks in motorsport right now for on track action. Really, really good stuff. I would love to talk about Silverstone and, and its new layout, new layout 10 years ago, uh, more. But there's enough questions from us because the F1 Feeder Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. And we're not going to get through many, many questions, sadly. I've gone far too long. But we're going to move on to the part of the podcast where you, you have your say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord, using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. This one comes from F1 Bear Doggo. Great name. This is for Jack. What has been your favorite car to drive as you've driven a few ones there, a few different ones there? Ooh. Um... Good question. Vauxhall Corsa? <laughs> yeah, up there, but somehow, you know, perhaps beaten by the uh, the Formula One car. Um, the Formula One, I'm just going to bunch them together, has to be up there because when you get in and you sit in it for the first time and you do your uh, control checks and everything, you just, you don't have to be told that every piece of this machine has been made bespokely for this car because you can feel it. Um, it's a level of quality that you don't see anywhere else or that I have not seen anywhere else in most sport. Um, and it's just incredible. Uh, and it drives that way too. The level of downforce in this generational cars that we have now um, is like playing a video game. You know, I've been lucky enough to drive at Suzuka in um, uh, 2018, uh, 2019 Renault. And it was the best day of my life without question. Or <laughs> well, best day of the car. Um, just incredible. So, but if you exclude F1, because maybe that's a bit unfair, the old Dallara F3 car, the F312. Everyone says F3. Yeah, drivers love it because that was, um, obviously safety standards have moved on. That's the reason why cars are getting heavier. Mm. Um, but that was so light, so agile, so so nimble. Um, and it had a very sweet engine in it, even if it wasn't um, the most powerful, whether it was the Volkswagen or the Mercedes, it was just a package that worked very, very nicely. And it, it gave you a lot of confidence and to get relatively quick in one was quite easy, but to get those last three temps, very, very difficult. You had to really get into the marginal gains and um, be very, very precise with your driving. So very enjoyable car to drive. The big takeaway from me on this one, Jack, is that you may be racing in tin tops, but we've not lost you yet. You're still our single seater at heart. So that's that's great to great to hear from an F1 feeder series host. This next one goes, which I think we spoke about already, but this one's from Adrian King. In light of this weekend's accidents and near misses, what further safety measures can the governing bodies put in place to ensure driver and spectators' safety? I'm going to put this one to you, Tom. I know it's very difficult to say, but with Joe's crash, 
we always get those those um, disclaimers when you get your ticket for any motorsport race. You go to motorsport is dangerous. You could be injured, but you don't really think as a fan in the grandstand that's going to be the case. But carbon fiber could have easily gone into somebody's well eye or whatever in in that grandstand. What what more can be done, or can they do anything? I think. I'm going to look at this from a slightly different angle and off the top of my head, try and explain my thoughts as best possible. I don't think we've wholly thought through the, the, the sort of changes that we need through this generational change of track limits. So it's almost as if we've created this track limit issue by making the track safer, but with it comes a culture where, Tactically, racing has changed. So the way you go about racing side by side or with other cars will be vastly different on a circuit that has wide expanses of runoff. You can keep your foot in, you can unravel the lock, you can do various different things, you can rejoin in in an unsafe manner. I think we need to look at, and Formula One have gone back to this, policing the white line hmm. and... When I was playing rugby, when I was younger, I didn't just carry on running when I ran out the pitch. I, I kind of, I kind of just, you have to stop. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. I got squashed, but you, you, you kind of had to stop. And, and we need to start to adopt this mindset in this generational change that if you drive off the track, you can't just keep your foot in or know from the apex that you're going to keep your foot in whatever and, and just continue at this, this rate of knots. Now, I'm not saying I have a magic wand and all the solution, but we, we kind of need to think about it. And I like that long lap penalty that they use in bikes. Now, it's not for the reasons that, that I've said, but if you essentially go off track, would people be less likely to go off track if you had to serve like the, the long lap penalty at Luffield or something like that, where, where you had to duck off and, 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 and run around that a bit like how they use the attack mode in, in, um, I mean, it would take a lot of policing initially because people run off all the time, but at some stage, I think we need to look at how racing has changed tactically and how we police the white line, the quality control. Because if you go to a series, and I won't name any, I don't know, at some random European circuit, whether it's a club meeting or whatever it is to a Grand Prix, it, 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 the quality control in terms of how things are policed and the mindset and what happens, it's just all over the place. And it's almost like a lottery or, or, or making a mockery of, of, of racing. So that's kind of my brain dump, which I haven't explained that well, but... I think we need to, to get together and, and, and look at this, this whole white line thing and, and, and come up with a, with a much more robust mindset and culture around, around that white line. I think that's, you say it's a brain, but that's a really good point just on the rugby part of it. Just it's, there's a white line there and that is the track limit. And you know, in a world where we're speaking around Wimbledon right now, where Hawkeye exists to see if you're over the white line or not, it's maybe not down at the club level. If you hit the ball out by Wimbledon by like a meter, you don't just carry on playing. It's <laughs> like the ball's out. So, and you know that. And, and, and in motorsport, the, the, the sort of generational change into this hasn't really allowed for that mindset. And, and I think that there's like an elephant in the room there that we need to all get together and address this and actually have a standardization and a quality control that comes from the top down all the way through our sport. If, if I can add a quick thought, I think it's... It's on the track design. It has to come from the track design because and I think that's what you were getting at, Tom. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, it, you know, Monza is a perfect example. I was just racing there this weekend. Um, the weekend just gone. And um, in the ELMS, we had a slightly uh, tense message from race control. I think it was on Friday during practice along the lines of, we have five dedicated resources, including electronic and human for policing track limits. And we cannot keep up with a lot of you who keep going off, whether it's parabolica or on the tiny sliver of curb yeah. where you can fit one car length off the track at the exit of Lesmos or wherever. Um, and uh, they're really struggling to keep up. Um, yeah. All of that policing at the top level of most sport compared to a club level meeting, and they still couldn't do it. And it's because we could use the track. You know, there was tarmac on the exit of Parabolica. 
there was a car width of tarmac on the exit of Lesmo 2, even if it was only just a car's width. And that's completely stupid from a track design point of view. If they just brought the gravel um, half a meter closer on exit Lesmo 2, then you know the problem is completely solved. But that doesn't seem to be, or it wasn't a point of discussion when they did these changes with the latest curbs and so on. But I'm sure it will be going forward. It's changed the dynamic of racing there as well, because it, it's not impossible to overtake someone up the inside, because whoever's on the out. I will just roll off the brake, unravel a lot, go straight through, and I'll argue the case afterwards. It, it's just so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance as well because the, the tarmac is there for safety as well, so cars don't roll into the gravel and things like that, but then at what cost? And that's what, exactly what you're talking about, Tom, is just we're in this different generation of, of racing. This one's from Mike Wallace. For Jack, what was the biggest barrier to your progression in the junior series? Money. I thought I thought as much as that. Is there anything that you, you can expand we're, on? You said we're pressed for time, so <laughs> no, not seriously. No, sorry, it's, I, it, it, we all know the problems, but we don't know the problems from your perspective. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll be, I'll be a bit more serious. I, I'm one of the very lucky few um, who, whether it was through sponsorship or because my family were, were relatively well off was able to have a good career in most sport up to this point and hopefully will do in the future. Um, but most people cannot do that. And even I, you know, you know I there, there, there came a point where can you go that little extra mile and pay that extra bit of money to be in the top team? Um, and oftentimes it wasn't a little, you know, bit of money that we were talking about. And the answer can, comes back and it's no, we can't do that. And in F2 and F3, where the margins are so tight, we all know the importance of being with the right team. So absolutely, it's a it's always going to be a problem in motorsport. Um, or I don't know if you can call it a problem, it's just a fact of life. It's always been like that. Um, outside of that, um, I wish that I had probably known a bit more about motorsport when I was moving into cars when I was 16 or 17, all that our family did. Um, probably would have changed some of the choices that we made which series we, we went to maybe aimed for the ones that had a bit more track time. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that were uh, with the, the strongest drivers, the strongest field, the cars that would be most relevant for me going forwards. Um, but that's all stuff that's very difficult uh, to know before you learn it after a couple of years of being on that scene. Oh, fascinating insight because you do see families of motorsport, don't you? Because they've been doing it for, for generations and they know, know the advantages. This one just comes from Jed uh, for Tom. Jed brackets the JGG. Hmm. What are the differences between commentating for IndyCar versus Formula 1, 2 and 3? What kinds of things would you need to point out to viewers of one series compared to the others? Well, I think the hardest thing commentating on IndyCar is it's like a giant game of snakes and ladders. So you can be sort of on a conventional or alternate strategy and then all of a sudden the whole field just turns upside down. I mean, they've got slightly better with how they keep hold, they hold the yellows off, especially if they're moving into a pit stop window or, you know, or vice versa. But it, it's really hard to predict what's happening in IndyCar. So rule number one, don't try and predict what's happening. Try and be objective. Try and point out what is maybe not obvious to the viewer, you know, who's on what strategy, whether or not it's a two or a three stopper, talk about the tyres, that kind of stuff. I think Formula One, you know, that's obviously an honour and a privilege that I'm experiencing this year and sitting like, you know, next to the likes of Jolien Palmer and, and, and so forth and listening to their knowledge. It's, you know, it's, it's much more about what I call topping and tailing. So the formalities of commentary. So looking at clean ins and outs into graphics, working through information and that kind of stuff and trying to, just work alongside Jolin. You don't need to ask him too many questions. He could almost leave by himself. He knows what he wants to get out in terms of the information. And then the junior formula, it's a bit more fast and furious. So mm. it, it's less conversational. So what I will say with IndyCar and Formula One is you can be more conversational because it, it, it's a longer airtime. Whereas with the junior championships, it, it's fast and furious and the 
the action tends to call itself. So there's there's less opportunity to have a bit of a chin wag, a bit of a test match special, and there's more emphasis on actually just getting the action said and called. And so those are the main changes, if you like, or differences, but between the championships. Yeah, you did very well to help Mr. Mr. Benjamin this weekend when he was running out of breath with calling some of those those uh, fights for the lead in Formula Three. Just one more for you here, Jack. And we had a bunch, and I really wanted to go through more, but we're just not going to have the time. So apologies to anybody who did ask questions. This was from Karina uh, to Jack. What status does your latest win in GT have, considering all of your career wins so far? Ooh, um, I mean, I, I write if I'm going to rank uh, wins um, in my career, then I do it more on the the, um, the the difficulty of it and how satisfying it was for me, rather than saying, "Oh, this one was an F2, so that's definitely better than the one in F3," for example. Um, and the GT one was quite satisfying because it was a pole, my first pole in GT3 as well. And the field depth in uh, GT3 is just crazy, even compared to Formula 2 and Formula 3. Or, um, yeah, it's, it's quite a step up. You've got 20 drivers who are within seven or eight temps around the circuit like soundboard. That's very technical. Um, so that was, yeah, a, a really good moment for me. And then that, that led to the race win because... Um, we could just control it. So it wasn't one of the most exciting races that I've had, um, but it's a nice box to tick. Um, and hopefully I can have some, some even better ones in the future. Yeah, well, continue on doing what you're doing, picking up the silverware. I'm going to leave with these ones, and I can go to Michael and Tom with this. This is from Liam Talks Motorsport. Specifically to you, Tom, but I think, uh, Michael, with your advancement into the press conferences, you might be able to talk on this as well. Just any advice for journalism? Simple forward question. But let's go with you, Tom, just a bit more experience with your, uh, let's call it advanced years compared to Michael. You're still a very young man. But any advice for journalism? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, I, I'm not essentially a journalist. And I mean that with, with the utmost respect. A broadcast that, journalist, with, though. Well, I, I look up to journalists and, and what I'm saying, it, 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 you know, by saying that is that I, you know, I don't think I've, I've got some of the skill sets that, that are required. I mean, you know, I'm very fortunate to be a broadcaster, but I think the journalists, the attention to detail, the professional curiosity, the skills to articulate their thoughts, their vision and also the news, I think is, is, is phenomenal. So, so you kind of need in in my mind whether or not it's a broadcaster or a journalist that passion you know that burning desire to to actually live and breathe the sport and to have that curiosity that then comes off the back of that passion so that's important because you'll have probably certainly when you're starting off more bad days than you'll have good days because it's very difficult to 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 get people to respond nowadays you know no replies are a, a, an acceptable form of communication for some people. So that's really annoying when you're trying to sort of push along and, and climb the ladder. And I always try and make an absolute conscious effort of replying to every single message I get on social media and also email, especially if it's from people asking for help, because I wouldn't be where I am today unless people took that time and effort to respond to me. So I think that's really important. So keep Keep banging the door, keep reaching out, keep networking, keep communicating. Don't get down in the dumps if people don't respond. There will be people that do respond. You've just got to go out there and find them and, you know, have that, have that passion to, to, to keep cracking away. And, and, and also the patience, the patience to respect others doing a good job and, it's really easy to, to see somebody else that, that you might see as a peer or, you know, getting the break that you wanted and, 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 and being downbeat and frustrated about that, but know that they're doing a good job and that your time can come as well. So there's enough cake to go around, I always say. So have some grace and to congratulate people when they do well and, 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 and just keep plugging away yourself and, and, and your time will come. Well said, Tom. Uh, 
Michael, I presume you'll know what Liam's um, might be going through just with regards to sending messages, not getting replies, but you're now starting to live that dream, joining the press conferences, writing for various outlets and putting the knowledge that you have out to the world and joining some of the best podcasts about feeder series motorsport. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, take the opportunities you can get. Um, if they tell you to go on the podcast the day of, say yes, because um, you, you never know what kind of conversations you're going to get. But in all seriousness, I think there's two things I would say. And one of them is you have to be right in journalism. It, it is a fact. It's very much an accuracy-based profession. Um, that's why there's a lot of fact-checking. It's very rigorous. I work as a fact-checker as well at Feeder Series and at my student newspaper, the Chicago Maroon. Um, it's, it's really important because that's the way that people are going to find out the stories. And if you, you have to be committed to telling them as best as you can and as correctly as you can. But above all, I think you have to be good. Um, and I don't mean that good at what you do. I mean, be a good person because part of that comes from having that commitment to, to really telling those stories. But also it means there's this whole idea of being impartial and that's true. And it's a great thing to strive for. But at the same time, you have to be human in that way. You have to be able to understand what people are going through. If someone's had a really tough race, a driver just doesn't want to talk, don't press them. Let them let them have their space. Let the team principal have their have their space. Let anyone you're talking to. Um, because that's the way that you're going to be able to build that connection and show that you're more than just someone sticking a microphone in their face. You're you're someone who actually does care about them and wants to be, you know, not make them look bad in a way. And I think Certain people do have to be sometimes made to look bad. There's some pretty despicable things that some people do, especially in politics. But in motor racing, we are all ultimately, I mean, it is it is a job for a lot of us, but we are putting on a show. And the job of the media, I think, is to to communicate that. Last week, Will Buxton said this. Um, I asked actually a sort of similar question hmm. um, about, you know, what do you learn? And and he said one thing there that was you you have to really tell their stories and and show that they're the heroes. And I think that's what our job is. And as a junior series journalist, you, you have these drivers who really one thing they need above all is, is sponsorship and money and being in the media gives you the opportunity to give them that exposure and, and get their story out to the world. And it's hugely empowering for me. It's the main reason I love to do this. And I think in terms of anyone looking to do that, I think you just have to look, look for those stories and, and, and know in yourself that, that you're the right person to tell them and also know with whom you're communicating that, that you're going to be willing to to do that to the to make them look you know as as be as faithful to them as you can and, and and be as good to them as you can as a reporter. Yeah, well said as well. And I do want to stress um, one thing that I think was just across both of you there. The thing that Will Buxton said last week, if you didn't listen to that, Liam, was that he said it is better to be right than to be first. And I do think that's a problem that journalism is going yeah. through right now. Is in the age of Twitter, just getting a tweet out with incorrect information is starting to become normalized and it shouldn't be. So I think we need to all strive to be better on, on the journalism side of things to make sure we're putting out correct information. Listen, we went quite heavy on the journalism there. Uh, we called you a hero as well though, Jack. So I'm going to say thank you to joining as a hero onto the podcast. We could go for another hour, I'm sure, and ask all the rest of the questions. So thank you so much to everybody who did ask a question. If you'd like to have your question asked in a future episode, use a hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. If you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing all really helps us out. And if you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those plus the Twitter accounts of myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.